welcome to Convo Fango and my half ass Halloween party. It's October, so we're just fucking going in that closet and pulling out our Freddy Krueger underwear and just bringing it 100%. Also, I'm sorry I didn't bring enough to share for you guys because I drink, I eat five pounds at a time, but it's it's candy corn season. Uh, ooh. Somebody who's <laughs> oh. noxiously healthy, I love candy corn. I- <laughs> you do? Okay. Wow, I didn't expect to start this conversation with two candy corn lovers. Are you a candy corn lover? Do we have three? Um, you do not. <laughs> you, you do no. not. You this do. interview was over. No, no. Michael, we can talk. We can talk. Okay. <laughs> Michael, if you could just go ahead and mute. Um, oh, just mute. You- <laughs> no, I want, I, I always, I love the gummies and I love like little, you know, the, the fun size um, Snickers and Twix and Reese's mm. peanut butter cups. That was always my thing. I mean, who doesn't? But candy corn is, it's, it's a unique breed of folks that are candy corn fans. <laughs> yeah. I'll leave that territory to you too. <laughs> okay, Misha, I have a candy corn uh, army pin to send you after this then. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I will appreciate it. <laughs> okay, this is actually not a candy corn conversation. This is, we're talking about snatched, baby. <laughs> there we go. Oh, oh, oh good. There, there it is. Are. There. <laughs> Snap, chid. Snatch shed. Yeah, it, it's pronounced snatch actually. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know if you knew that. The film's snatch <laughs> Obviously, my palate is not as refined as yours because I like to just dump candy corn into my face. So. <laughs> oh, God, that's funny. <laughs> so this is part of Huluween's bite-sized Halloween, which is like, what, 21 short films? Yes, this year. Fun size, if you will, like fun little fun size good. grab bags of candy. Yeah. So tell us, what can we expect from Snatch? <laughs> from Snatch? Oh, man. Um, you know, you can expect 10 minutes of um, subversiveness and action and references and comedy. <laughs> and, you know, Misha and I have had really fun conversations the last couple months and have uh settled on this term of disco horror which we (laughs) love and maybe that phrase has been used before i i haven't seen it used before i Um, haven't heard it before yeah we we love it it's like um uh at one point we said it was john carpenter but make it fashion (laughs) that it was something that like you could you're you're gonna laugh you're gonna scream you're gonna think about your life choices (laughs) Um, you know, it's all of that, and and it's sort of blood on the dance floor. I, I actually found out that disco horror is an actual musical genre, by the way. That that late seventies, early eighties, it's this sort of you know dark. It's it's the space between disco and the sort of eighties electronica. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe like yeah, I, I just think it's uh, if it's a musical genre already, we might as well make it a film genre too. I'm loving all of this. Also, send your disco horror playlist, please. I'm going to embed it in this article. (laughs) Michael made two separate playlists. Two. (laughs) Shooting. We had Snatch Body, which is like, get your body ready. (laughs) And we had Snatch Soul, because there's a heart behind this film. I, I, I am a music listener. I'm a music listener when it comes to prepping for a role. And they were well listened to by myself. Um, So... Bravo, Michael. Give me like your top tracks from each of those, like prepping the body and prepping the soul. They're okay. Well, they're <laughs> understandably there's um there's some there's some RuPaul thrown into um mm-hmm. the Snatch Body. I, however, like some of the remixes. Like there's a Demi Lovato "Cool for the Summer" remix in there. <laughs> oh yeah, <sighs> it's just hot. Um, and then Snatch Soul was just like not to like call you out, Michael, but it was it was kind of like like sad gay boy alone in your room music. <laughs> okay. That's- quite literally what the film is about mm-hmm. so um but no it was it, they were both incredibly appropriate and very on point for the occasion i love this i'm loving all of this so much i will <laughs> definitely share those playlists i'm a musical person not just you know growing up in musical theater but i think music helps set a mood and a tone mm-hmm. especially a tone that's tricky with this sort of film that yes. sort of oscillates between horror and comedy and extremes very quickly in a matter of seconds uh and music helps ease those transitions you know so uh certainly the the snatched body which is you know featuring all the greatest hits of britney and whitney and (laughs) any Whitney basically you can think of um and then snatched soul uh you know i'll give a little bit of context if people want which is that our story takes place in marin county which is my hometown which is a, a sort of hippie enclave 
or used to be a hippie enclave uh, just north of San Francisco. And in, um, you know, the counterculture movement, the, the Dead, Janis Joplin, Youngbloods, they all lived in Marin and, and made music in Marin. Uh, and it's where the San Francisco sound of the late 60s, early 70s originated. And so a lot of that music, which parlays its way into the musical framework of the film, uh, references Rotary Connection, Minnie Ripperton, Bob Dylan, Grateful Dead, Youngbloods, this uh, sort of, um, you know, folk rock sound that came out of Marin in the San Francisco Bay. And so I wanted that authentic sound to be part of the film as well and to get it in our systems, which, uh, yes, can very well translate as sort of sad gay boy, you know, <laughs> uh, what's that SNL commercial? Wells for boys, <laughs> you know, where you can get like a well play set for a young, uh, sensitive boy. Uh, it's definitely along those lines. <laughs> I'm a big playlist girl and I'm big on like moods. Like even before like doing like an interview, a lot of times, like I have like a, like I have like a horror girl problems pump up playlist that I listen before I do an interview. And then, you know, like smacking myself in the face while making direct eye contact in the mirror, obviously yeah. as one does. Well, that's kind of a given. <laughs> yeah, right. That's just like a, does it even need to be said? Like, <laughs> so I love that you use that and kind of infuse that, use that and infuse that. There we go. Yeah, I love yeah, it. Well, especially for something like this where you don't, I, I, I didn't get to, well, I met Misha right before we shot. Um, Tatiana and Brendan, uh, we had one Zoom call before I met them on set. Um, I had met Brendan before over the years. I hadn't met Tap before. Uh, and you know, there's only so much you can communicate with your mm -hmm. actors before you're on set. and. Um, trying to get everyone on the same wavelength, right. uh, sending them playlists, I hope Misha can confirm or not, uh, should hopefully be helpful as, along with all this sort of, you know, words of what we're going for in terms of tone and backstory. Well, yeah, and also like, it's the, it's the nature of any set, but like, especially the nature of this kind of set, like it's a short film. We have very limited time to get, a, in this case, a lot done. The yeah. film covers a lot of ground in a very short amount of both on-screen time and shooting time. Um, so anything that can get you in the mood early and like I like I loved like going over to Michael's place for like one day to like prep before we all went to SF and shoot like that that kind of stuff is a gift when it comes to shooting because it doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. um, can we talk about this cast because like Misha like how did you get involved with this and also just like your cast I'm like what the fuck it's a short film like I don't expect this kind of a cast in a short film you know what I'm saying. That's, it's all Michael I that that truly is all Michael's sort of like family culture building personality that like we all kind of spider webbed out that's it's a horrible way to describe it but michael you go <laughs> yeah you know so M misha i knew about misha for a number of years uh and misha later told me that misha had heard my name through mutual friends as well yes. so we sort of knew of each other mm -hmm. Um, and funny enough, Misha did do Shakespeare in Marin years ago, right? So you had yeah. been to Marin before, I where had. we shot. Um, and I saw Freaky last year, obviously, and was like, who is this magical unicorn? Uh, <laughs> I thought she was so amazing in that movie. Uh, and then when I was here last January, uh, I met a mutual friend of ours, Oscar Sharp, who's a, a filmmaker, um, and was actually telling Oscar about another project of mine that takes place at a therapeutic boarding school, which uh, Misha has a, a project about as well. And uh, we're both great advocates for you know mental health, particularly teen mental health, mm -hmm. um, and making sure those conversations continue uh, in any way possible. Um, and so then I, when I got this pitch on, and, uh, I got the opportunity to pitch with 24 hours notice, uh, I wrote, I wrote this film that night. I wrote it in about 15, 20 minutes, this script, the night I found out I could pitch 20th century, 20, 20th digital studio, which is part of 20th century Fox. Um, and then thankfully Oscar put me in touch with Misha and, and Misha and I had a lot of really lovely conversations, you know, I sort of what Misha said before, you don't always get the opportunity to um, build something together. And I am 100% a collaborative writer director. I, I, I don't want to be um, creating anything in a silo. This is a collaborative art form and everybody has something to contribute. Uh, and uh, my conversations with Misha, with Leon, who plays Miles, completely informed the characterization and, and how to go about this. Uh, how to go about telling the story in, in the best, most authentic way possible. Mm -hmm. um, and Tatiana and Brendan, I had met Brendan at a, at a wedding a few years ago, <laughs> funny enough, and, and, you know, I had seen Brendan in many things before, but 
uh, a mutual friend when I sort of created this insane character that had to go back and forth between extreme comedy and real anger, real rage. Um, it, it required someone who could jump into those emotions very quickly. Um, and they don't know this, so I, it's funny. I, I, well, I didn't know Brendan and Tatiana were together. Oh. I had no idea. Uh, I don't think anyone knew, you know, and, and that's uh, awesome. Uh, uh, and when Brendan uh, read the script, he shared it with his wife and she uh, read it and um, asked if she could be a part of it. And never in a million years, you know, you just have to picture me getting that text message and just sobbing in the New York City apartment, jumping up and down because I knew She-Hulk was about to come out. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we're all huge fans of hers. Never in a million years when you get projects like this, do you think um, that you could get someone of, of her, her caliber um, on board, uh, let alone, you know, really game to play in this sandbox. And um, the fact that they're married, the last film I did featured a married couple. So, so clearly I'm on a roll. With <laughs> and they, as Misha can attest, were um, just the greatest delights in the world. And the three of them made a family unit so quickly. Misha, <laughs> you can say how for years people said you were the, what, you were the secret uh, I hold it. it's child it's twin <laughs> sibling. Specifically of Tatiana, like she, it's just a very, there's a very similar set of features going on. <laughs> um, but no, they were super game on set. It really is. And a lot of this has to do with my goals, again, kind of sort of set culture building, but like we had very limited time. So we all instantly locked into playing and that's not something you get sometimes on a feature set, on a TV set. So the fact that we were all just there game ready to play to the extreme that this script wanted us to was really fun. It was a really fun shoot overall. And it, a lot of that had to do with uh, Tat and Brendan. Extreme is a perfect word for this because I was not expecting it to go as extreme as it does. <laughs> like, I, there's a lot about this I wasn't expecting. I was like, what is this cast for a 10 minute short film? I don't understand, like, how is this happening? And then just, I was like, okay, like I get the concept and I love it. And I, I'm thinking like, but it's gonna go maybe in a certain way. And then it just, it gets very extreme. And I'm like, what is, happening it's hard it's it's hard to be surprised anymore right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. everything we see these days follows so many formulas which are meant to make us feel um smart or that we know where things are going right. or that are easy to digest mm -hmm. and what i love about my conversations with tat and brendan and misha was we wanted to create a story that um, provoked conversation that mm -hmm. provoked, oh my God, I need to watch that again. Yes. Um, that, that really subverted your expectations when you thought it would go left, we'd go right. Um, because obviously it is a timely story and it was written in response to something that was timely and urgent for many queer kids across the country. Mm -hmm. And so it was sort of an opportunity to as you're saying, let's create a 10 minute film. And then beyond that, how can we, like we're having right now, actually provoke conversations about these things so that the story can live on past the 10 minutes, right? There's, a, there's just this comedy of like, where it's very you're like cringing at it because you're like, oh God, like it's just so like, oh, please mom, dad, stop. Like, please just stop. And then so brutal, which it's like, the brutality in itself would be terrifying, but going from that like bright and sunny and like, you know, cringy shit that your parents are saying, you're like, oh God, mom, come on. To that brutality, like with that, like just like a flip like that, it's just, it's a terrifying <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. But also I, the funny thing is having stepped into, as y'all know, having stepped into horror comedy before, every horror comedy has its own chemistry mm -hmm. because while the two go hand in hand really lovely, walking that tightrope is inherently hard for writing, for directing, for acting. Mm -hmm. um, but with this one, I had not done something like this where both the time frame, there's no build up. You can't like build up to a tone shift. You have 10 minutes. Um, but because of that, and I think Michael, this is something that we said in like our first like sit down rehearsal in LA, like the the precision with which you change tone has to be pretty workmanlike and like you have to be like prepared for it because it falls on 
equally the actor and the director in this case to like make that tone shift happen mm -hmm. in such a way that like you can accomplish everything you want to accomplish in 10 minutes because it, this film could easily be a feature and we're all obviously hoping that it will be um but it that would allow more space for it to breathe right now this is getting the hardest punches in this film out in 10 minutes and that requires real precision mm -hmm. um, on every front yeah that's an interesting point misha that What's funny about it is it's actually a three act structure. The, the first act's the bedroom, second act's the kitchen, the third act is the car in the street. And there are bridges between the two acts that are about 10 seconds each. And those bridges are our opportunities to shift tone. And we talked about that on set. And what's fascinating to me is obviously the kitchen scene is so absurd and, and real, you know, heightened comedy. But Something that I find fascinating about this is um, the queer people who watch the film say, oh, but that's horror to me. Mm. That, and that's sort of my hope is talking to my own parents, talking to other uh, people of a, an older generation, they don't see the horror in the first half of the movie. Mm. Um, but queer people do and people of color do in that um, we are setting up a discomfort that uh, and a sort of horrifying reality that is more horrifying than shadows and jump scares, that the sort of performative allyship and the cringe can actually be horrifying and can actually, when misplaced, be harmful, right, mm -hmm. which is part of the film. Um, and so, you know, everything from the beginning of, you know, one of the first images being a black boy in a hoodie, and if you have any ideas about what you think that means, we will a moment later let you know that if you had any negative connotation about that, you're wrong. That's, this is the romantic love interest and he will ultimately become the hero, right? And so we wanted to sort of set up those tropes uh, and then subvert them in ways that make you question why you were scared to begin with. That's interesting that you said that like your queer queer friends and queer audiences are picking up on the cringe because I just to me I'm like, oh, everyone would find that part horrific. And I'm like, okay, maybe I get I guess not. To me, I'm like that that concept of like you have assigned me a label and now you put me into a very specific box, whether or not that's who I am in reality, that's who I am now in in your mind, in your perspective. And like now your interaction with me is completely only based on that. And that's such a horrific and icky kind of feeling. And you capture it so well in that scene. And it's just the whole thing. I'm just so uncomfortable. I'm just like, oh God, please stop, 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 stop. <laughs> yeah, Angel, you know, what's so interesting about that. I just um, talked to two people in their seventies um, last night who had watched the film. Um, and they said, well, what's the big deal about the limp? Why, why did he do his son's wrists? Mm -hmm. I don't get why, why break the wrists? And I had to explain to them that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> about, about how for you, you know, that was the stereotype mm -hmm. is if you're a gay boy, uh, you have a lisp or you have a limp wrist and that the father's actually not if you know not trying to harm the son in, in reality the father's trying to help the son mm -hmm. by making him fit the mold of what he thinks his gay son should look like right and what characteristics right. he should have um and for me the film should work on a base level right if uh you know there's sort of the old test of if it's a silent film can you get the essential story mm -hmm. just by the visuals and and my hope is certainly this would work if you turned off the volume, you know, and you see two boys kissing and in secret and the sort of coming out scene and that you can get the basic story. But then there are these layers that are for queer people to make them feel included, to make mm -hmm. them feel smart, to make them feel taken care of. Um, and horror which, fans. Like it's, and horror fans, of course. It's And th there's a lot of intersection there. I know we know that, but like yeah. it's the level of horror references. I, I, I keep telling Michael, but like it's it, it, it impresses me the level to which and the speed with yes. which we do horror yes. references. <laughs> it's impressive to me. I don't know that I could pull it off if I was in a similar position. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes it really fun too, because it's like these little kind of Easter eggs where it's like, we're doing a nod to this and not this, but it's buried in there. It's like, like a joke, you know what I mean? Like these little like kind of like zingers on most and it's like that's fun oh. for horror fans because you're like it's like that leonardo dicaprio meme right where you're like ah like that was me watching that. <laughs> totally. yeah. and it's fun like we should a horror is for audiences mm -hmm. right we don't make this for us 
The whole point of this is for you to engage with it. And I think because a lot of us sort of came from theater backgrounds and, and understand the relationship between audience and stage, here there's a relationship between the screen and the audience. And so our job is to help facilitate that experience for you as an audience goer. I love that. So the hope is to turn this into a feature, right? They ideally, the ideal scenario. Definitely. <laughs> Amazing, because I would love, like, we get, a, we get a snippet. This is like an appetizer of this really like much bigger story that could, could be unfolding. And I, I want more of that. Like I watched it and I was like, oh, I need more of this. I need to, I need to know, like it works as a standalone, but also I'm like, I want to explore more of this world and what happens after this. Okay. And a moose bouche for the snatch. And a moose bouche for the snatch. <laughs> uh, for the snatch fans out there. That's yeah. it. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I really hope so too. I only, I also, Michael and I have talked about how we are in this really interesting phase with content creation where the next phase of something is often what's the most exciting. Like with Marvel, you have comic books into TV shows, into movies. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I think, and so much of horror has been that, well, I look at the Stephen King formula, you know, but like, I, I think that we're in a phase now where people are so ready to accept new ideas as small pieces of IP for the industry folks listening. Why not? <laughs> um, but like it, these small s stories, these small ideas can easily grow in the way that the entertainment industry is working right now. So like right. something like this, where you do watch it and you think, God, I want more. Like mm -hmm. I, fuck yeah. Can I say fuck? You can uh -huh. say fuck yeah. I say this is Great. I, I would, uh, there would be ha constant bleeps if we weren't allowed to say that. I just, <laughs> um, I, I, I'm very excited to see what Michael's brain does with this in feature form. Now that and you've also, mentioned that, I would love this as like a comic book series, I think would be really Ooh, cool. I love that. I think that'd be uh -huh. awesome. <laughs> and, and Misha can't, Misha's not going to pass for 15, uh, for the, all the decades to come. <laughs> we, I can we're all the sunscreen I want, but... <laughs> Um, but also, it, you know, you bring up the future, Angel, you know, every decade since the 50s, there has been a body snatcher story. And it has always reflected the times, right? Mm -hmm. So while this is not an official body snatcher, you know, we don't have the rights to Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Um, starting back in 1956 with the original, uh, which took place in Marin, by the way, it is it has always been a Bay Area set story. Um, but, you know, in 1956, it was an allegory for McCarthyism. 19 78, the one with Donald Sutherland, Jeff Goldblum, uh, that was post-Vietnam, the sort of end of the, you know, hippie era, mm -hmm. uh, lamenting the end of the family unit. Um, and while there has never been this particular story told within that framework, um, you know, for me, the Body Snatchers allegory works so well for this moment we're in, in terms of identity politics, in terms of um, having a queer lead character, mm -hmm. um, which oftentimes in horror, while there's queer subtext or queer supporting characters, very rarely they are front and center, right. which was important. And also Joey, the character Misha plays, funny enough, is the straight man, which we had a lot of conversation <laughs> about, right? <laughs> that that yeah. always uh, the queer character is supposed to come with the quip all of a right. sudden mm -hmm. and to be funny. And for mm -hmm. us, it was like, no, if, if, if the if the queer protagonist is actually the straight man, so to speak, um, we are better able and still have a sense of humor about themselves. It's not like they're, they're humorless, um, but to to really get from their, their perspective what is happening, yes. um, I think is a, is a asset. Um, and yeah, we're over. The last one was the invasion, which was the Nicole Kidman, uh, Daniel Craig one 10, 15 years ago, which, you know, wasn't heavy on the allegory. Um, the faculty came out when I was in mm -hmm. high school, mm -hmm. which, you know, is a riff on that as well, which I loved. Um, but, but what's also fun is that the pendulum has swung the other way, right? So in all the other Body Snatchers movies, once an alien's made a duplicate of you, you become uh, dead-eyed. Right. You become emotionless. And in the original book, that's how it's described. And so part of the joke for us is what if it's the opposite? <laughs> what if it makes you overly emotional? What if the aliens swing the pendulum so far the other way, which obviously in our culture of, you know, Twitter and everyone just getting angry at each other out of nowhere, it seems like the more appropriate allegory to not be dead eyed, but to actually be so overly emotional that we're not even listening to one another. And that that's 
violent that can cause violence when you don't listen which was such a hilarious approach to it because it's like one of those like monkey paw situations you know what i mean it's like oh gosh i only wish my parents were more this and then this happens and you're like oh, okay maybe like not quite let's take it a couple okay. ticks back in the other direction yeah, yeah, yeah. because this is a little bit what the fuck you know <laughs> but I, I i love that it's like like that's not something i would have like thought to go in a horror element like oh gosh what if your parents were just so overly supportive and like <laughs> how horrific would that be and it's like okay yeah and then you show us this and it's just like what the fuck is happening <laughs> so good oh so we it's funny right we as queer creators don't need another coming out story per se and i never thought i would write something like this but we've seen the story where parents are um, uh, not comfortable with their mm -hmm. son coming out, uh, however they may come out. And something that um, I, we just hadn't seen before was this idea of people who say they're inclusive, who will virtue signal up the wazoo, and not just about queer people. That's why we sort of have, you know, the Jew yeah. joke and the <laughs> Jew joke in there is that it hints at the broader world of, um, sort of performative allyship and that when it when it's missing action mm -hmm. and listening um it's generally not helpful and so my hope is that um people just think about how they can be better allies to one another uh in a way that is healthy for everyone yeah with just that like that smile plastered across the face right and like the bright eyes and like i'm being helpful i'm being supportive it's like no, no, but I'm actually telling you, like, maybe, like, take it down a notch, please. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm helpful and I'm supportive. It's like, ah, what the fuck? Like, well, you know, it's kind of scary. Uh, they'll never listen to this, so it's okay <laughs> if I talk about it. Um, my partner's parents, I was talking to them last night, and they have an In This House We Believe sign on their lawn, uh, which at the end of the film, you know, is 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 a moment. And um, and in talking to them last night, I, I you know, was terrified. These are my in-laws. And I, and I didn't even realize that when I wrote it in the script. But I said, you guys do realize that I'm all for everything that's on that sign, mm -hmm. obviously, like that, that we, I am um, not criticizing those, um, those, uh, those values, those, those yeah. values, <laughs> no way. What, what I am satirizing is the fact that the two people in the film who put that sign down, which by the way, is uh, Sid Gannis, who is the former president of the Motion Picture Academy. Oh, okay. He, he was... <laughs> had a Lucasfilm and um, had a Paramount for 20 years. And so it's really fun cameo. Again, with this cast, what the, it's a 10 yeah. minute short. What is this oh, cast? It does so, not make sense. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so amazing. Um, but uh, 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 they put that sign down after watching a man break his son's wrists and they don't do anything about They're it. They're just like. Right. Instead, they <laughs> smile and put their sign down, which obviously is is hopefully, uh, you know, you get the idea that it's not a criticism of those values. It is a criticism of standing by while real violence is taking place and saying, oh, no, I've put my sign down. Uh, I've done enough. <laughs> right. Put the sign in. Well, that's uh, that's it for me for the year. And I'm, I'm good. Gonna, Thank you. I'll go get a pride whopper and call it a day. <laughs> a double, a double bottom whopper. Or that <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. All right. Is there anything else you would like people to know going into this before we head out? Um, Misha? Or anything you hope they would take away? Anything like? Um, I, I I like what Michael said earlier. This is for the audience. This film, and I'm learning as I I learn about horror as I work in it. I wasn't mm -hmm. the horror nerd growing up, um. So I I love that this film is so explicitly for the audience. We want you to laugh. We want you to scream. Like that's everything is put in there for your eyes and for your enjoyment. We're not taking this terribly seriously, partially right. because a lot of the th themes like the queerness, like the coming out, all of that kind of stuff, it's inherently serious. We all know it's serious. This film is just exploding it and subverting it. So yeah, have fun. I think have fun with this film when you're watching it. And there's no filler here, babies. This is a tight 10 minutes, jam packed, boom, boom. Yeah. <laughs> Jam packed, and hopefully, and just like you said, Misha, that it, that I think you're so right on about it being for the audience, and also then what? So what happens after this, right? You can imagine what happens to Joey in the moments at the end of the film. You can also imagine where in your own life you are are 
are maybe um, responsible for some of the themes that are in this film, or you see people in your family, and it uh, and it makes you want to have a conversation with them. That's you're so right about it. these things are serious enough. These issues are serious enough, and that's the power of horror and the power of comedy. Right? Is that we can have fun with serious things. Uh, horror makes death more pal palatable, makes it easier to di to digest. Um, and then what happens next? Uh, where, what do you do with that new found comfort? Um, and I think that's right on, Misha. We just hope you have fun and uh, enjoy the ride. Yay. Beautiful. That's a beautiful spot to end it. So, Snashe. Snashe. That's the goddamn title. <laughs> Snatched. Hulu. Hulu bite Hulu. size Halloween. It's streaming right now. You guys can it watch is. it right now. Yes, season yes. three, episode three. All threes. There's three actors on the poster. <laughs> it's season three. It's episode three. It's snatched. It's snashe. It's <laughs> snatched. <laughs> Roll threes. Three is also my favorite number. So now this has three titles. We have three actors. It's season three, episode three. This is all the synergy. The synergy is strong synergy. with this yes. one. <laughs> I'm right. so we're so appreciative we could talk to you, Angel. Um, so Are you fun. kidding me? I'm appreciative that I can talk to you guys about this. I was so excited. Like I'm a nerd for this stuff, so I'm like, yay! I'm excited that I could just get well, to chat with you about the cool thing you made. Well, we're nerds for Fangoria, so we all win. Yay! Yeah, gotcha. right. Angel, by the way, I told you that like when I was a kid, and my my I don't know why it was always shoe shopping. My mom would go <laughs> shoe shopping at the mall. Not that she needed all these shoes. And, um, she had bunions on her feet. That's why. Oh, no, yes. She's not going to listen to this either. So she doesn't care. I'm just going to talk shit about all the people. Oh, about, all the anyway, um, about all the parents. About all the parents. So, but while she would shoe shop, um, there was like the magazine, um, you know, like newspaper place at the bottom of the store. And I would hide in the corner with Fangoria because it was like, as I've learned, like the, um, there's something about these images of demons and, and dress up that queer kids relate to, that they find interesting, that maybe makes them feel like they're not the only weirdo or the only freak, but then at the same time, it's also dress up and it's play and it's pretend. And, you know, to a, to a young kid who was reading Fangoria, it was like the greatest comfort in the world to see Freddy Krueger on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to digest those pages. It was just the best. So thank you for continuing that legacy. Amazing. I mean, I'm just grateful that I get to be a, a part of it because I was that kid as well, you know, sneaking Fangoria's like it was porn. Like that was yeah, my like, porn. I'm like, porn. oh, my mom's going to kill me if she sees me looking at this. Like, <laughs> it's Fangoria. It's like, yeah. Totally Amazing. All right. Thank you guys so much. I'm excited for everyone to watch this. Go watch Snatched on Hulu streaming right now. <laughs> <laughs>